services without you. You're listening to bostonfreeradio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on Boston Free Radio and WBCALP Boston, watching and listening on Somerville Community Access TV or some community access TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast, and to them I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. And I have five new movies to review for you for this show. First, though, let's get into my first segment, which is What's Topping the Box Office? These are the top ten highest grossing films of this past weekend. And the brand new movies that have come out have actually dominated at least the top of this chart, beginning with the movie Night School, starring Kevin Hart and Tiffany Haddish, one of the five movies I'll be reviewing for you for this show. It took in a very impressive $27.3 million here in the States and Canada. And around the world it took in $33.2 million and that is against a budget of $29 million. So while it's not a hit yet here in the United States and Canada, I'll just say here domestically, it is very, very close to being a tentative hit. Around the world it is already a tentative hit, so it's off to a really good start. Smallfoot is another movie that debuted this weekend and takes the number two spot, having grossed $23 million here at home, and $38.5 million around the world. And that's kind of a rough smart st- rough start for Smallfoot, considering that it has grossed 80, excuse me, it cost $80 million to make. That's part that I'm going to be editing out of the podcast here. But in any event, Smallfoot still has a long way to go to recoup its budget, but given that it's number two at the box office, it does have a somewhat encouraging start. I wouldn't exactly say a promising one. The House with a Clock in Its Walls was number one at the box office last week. This week, in its second week in release, it slid to number three, having grossed $12.6 million at the U.S. box office and Canada this past weekend. Against a budget of $42 million, which is actually not bad considering the stars it has in it, as well as the ornate decorations within the movie, or the set design, I should say. The House with the Clock in Its Walls has grossed $44.9 million domestically and $65.9 million internationally, which makes it a tentative hit here, at home, and around the world. So it still has a ways to go to become a certified hit, but it is a tentative hit, and that's better than nothing. A Simple Favor was number two at the box office last week. This week it slid to number four, having grossed $6.5 million here at home in its third week in release. Against a modest budget of $20 million, A Simple Favor has so far grossed $43 million here in the States, and around the world it has grossed $62.8 million, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. And yeah, this movie is definitely generating a lot of word of mouth buzz which i think is actually deserved the nun i can't exactly say the same for because i saw this movie four weeks ago when it came out i wasn't crazy about it but in any event it did gross 5.4 million dollars here at home and is number five at the box office sliding from number three last week and it should stick around for halloween i would imagine but against a budget of 22 million dollars which is quite modest the nun has so far grossed 109 million dollars here in the states and 329.2 million dollars worldwide making it a certified hit here at home and abroad hellfest is a movie that debuted this week at number six which is not huge but it made 5.1 million dollars here at home against a budget of 5.5 million dollars so for a film of that low a budget it's off to a really good start i don't have the international numbers for you but i can tell you it's not hit yet here in the states or rather here in the states and canada in the states and provinces but i can tell you that it will probably be a tentative hit at least by next week 
Crazy Rich Asians is still hanging in there seven weeks after it debuted, and it slipped from number five last week to number seven this week, having grossed $4.1 million here at home. Against a budget of $30 million, Crazy Rich Asians has so far grossed $165.6 million domestically and $219.4 $219.4 million internationally. And I knew the international numbers would eventually pick up for Crazy Rich Asians. After all, look at the title of the movie, which I'm sure is the same in other markets as it is here. But in any event, it is a certified hit here in the States and around the world, and no one can take that away from Crazy Rich Asians. So very good for that movie. And my guess is we'll probably see a sequel in the next couple of years. The Predator is a movie that is still in the top 10, but is struggling mightily. This week, it took a big drop from number four last week to number eight this week, having grossed $3.9 million here at the domestic box office. Against a budget of $88 million, The Predator has so far grossed $47.8 million here in the States and $116.2 million worldwide, making it not a hit yet here in the States. And around the world, it is a 10 hit. So that means that chances are looking kind of dim for this reboot of the Predator franchise, and we may not see a sequel as a result. White Boy Rick is number nine at the box office, sliding from number six last week, having grossed $2.4 million here at home. Against a budget of $29 million in its third week in release, White Boy Rick has so far grossed $21.7 million here in the States and Canada. Around the world, I don't have any international numbers for you, but it's not looking good for White Boy Rick either. This looks like it's a movie that's going to be a bomb. It may eke its way to being a 10 hit, but right now, the numbers do not look good for White Boy Rick. And finally, number 10 at the box office is Peppermint, which grossed $1.8 million here at home in the States and Canada. Against a budget of $25 million, though, Peppermint has so far grossed three, uh, excuse me, $33.5 million here in the U.S. and Canada, and around the world it has grossed $39.5 million, which makes it a tentative hit here in the States and around the world. So you can't exactly call Peppermint a huge box office success, but it pulled in some relatively impressive numbers for the four weeks it was in release and it may eventually become a certified hit but definitely not while it's in the top 10 and i would imagine i won't be seeing this movie in the top 10 come next week 180 over 111 and i had a stroke i couldn't speak or walk 150 over 90 and i had a stroke This is what high blood pressure sounds like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from silent. Get back on your treatment plan or talk with your doctor to create a plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhbp.org. I had to tell everything's changed. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association, American Medical Association, and the Ad Council. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is evening gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more. Making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you for this show and for this week is Night School, the latest starring Kevin Hart and co-starring Tiffany Haddish. It is about a group of troublemakers who are forced to attend night school in hopes that they'll pass the GED exam to finish high school. And one of those troublemakers is a man by the name of Teddy Walker, who's played in this movie by... By Kevin Hart. And Teddy Walker is a guy who is a little bit of a black sheep in his family, uh, particularly because he has a twin sister who did a lot better in high school than he did. As a matter of fact, when he was in high school in 2001, he was taking a test that was similar to the SATs, although for some reason they didn't call it the SATs in this movie. I think they called it the, the G-Cats or something. I don't know why you wouldn't use SATs if you had to pay the Princeton Review or what have you. But in any event, Teddy Walker, Kevin Hart's character, took this test, realized he couldn't pass, and right there on the 
spot, just dropped out of high school. 17 years later, he's actually doing pretty well for himself as a barbecue salesman. And he also has a beautiful, drop-dead gorgeous girlfriend named Lisa, who's played in this movie by Megalyn Echikawoke. I hope I pronounced that name right. But in any event, he pops the question to her in the barbecue place, but ends up causing a fire despite the fact that he was actually promised the position of CEO by the person who runs the uh, barbecue sales place. But when those hopes are dashed, Teddy Walker has to find that he needs to go back to school to complete his GED in order to get another sales job. So there's something actually pretty admirable about somebody not finishing high school but still making a name for himself but at the same time this movie does have at least a good message on its side in that there's always one more time and it's never too late to finish your education but it's not one of those feel-good movies and it's also not one of those films that is particularly edgy and i think that this movie had the potential to be an R-rated comedy that would have brought the laughs, but instead it kind of settled for PG-13. But in any event, Kevin Hart finds himself in a group of, well, the description says troublemakers, as I read to you, but they're more like misfits. For, um, they're just people who didn't eventually get around to finishing their high school education. There's one stay-at-home mother. There's another guy who made a living as a mover but finds himself pushing 50 and not able to get any other jobs despite his qualifications without a high school diploma. And there's also a guy who's in prison who is taking the class via Skype. And that's th that guy who's a prisoner is played by Fat Joe, who I think was one of the funnier parts of this movie. And they're all being taught by an overworked high school teacher named Carrie, who's played by Tiff Tiffany Haddish. And of all the characters in the movie, I did think Tiffany Haddish was probably the best character in here. Not only was she really funny, but also she had some heart to her, so much so that I, I wish they'd make a spinoff of this movie with just Tiffany Haddish's character in the film, kind of detailing her struggles day to day with being a, a teacher and having to take on a certain workload while being underpaid. I think that would make a good comedy drama for the future, if I might suggest that. And, of course, if Tiffany Haddish would revisit her role, that would be even better. And I liked some of the times that Tiffany Haddish and Kevin Hart worked alongside each other but when it's revealed that and this is not too much of a spoiler kevin hart's character has dyslexia in addition to some other learning disabilities i i wasn't especially fond of the way the movie handled that for instance there are scenes where kevin hart is trying to do his assigned homework for this night school class and tiffany haddish keeps popping up in his head going saying over and over again, focus. Well, somebody with learning disabilities probably wouldn't benefit from somebody saying focus over and over again. And there was another troubling scene in this film that was meant to be for laughs, but when you step back and actually look at it for what it is, it is basically showing Tiffany Haddish and Kevin Hart in a boxing ring or a, a mixed martial arts ring, and... Tiffany Haddish's character is asking Kevin Hart's character questions like, what's 12 times 9, and what's the capital of Belgium? And when he doesn't get the answer right, she starts beating on him. And while it is kind of funny to see Tiffany Haddish beat on another guy, even though it is Kevin Hart who's diminutive in stature, it kind of it raises some... <laughs> troubling questions like for instance i i would like to think that both kids and maybe educational professionals who watch this film don't take this for face value and think that in order to teach a student no matter what their age 
anything that they have to take them into a ring and start beating on them. I, I thought that distracted from the film a little bit, but I did laugh at, at various parts of this movie. I did think Kevin Hart was funny in it, although I wished he could have been a little bit edgier, and I wish the film actually could have been rated R, because after all, it's a movie about night school, or in other words, adult education, so why wouldn't it be a little bit more adult? But I think that's an issue with Hollywood casting these two popular comedians in a in a movie together i think this is their first movie together if i'm not mistaken and i think they wanted to appeal to as wide an audience as possible but honestly if they had made it r-rated i think it actually would have gotten even bigger laughs and it did follow a predictable story arc here and there particularly concer- concerning kevin hart's characters ups and downs in going back to school but i didn't hate the movie i actually as i said i loved tiffany haddish's character i also like the fact that kevin hart and tiffany haddish didn't form a romantic relationship i i thought the film was going there but fortunately they avoided that so night school gets my rating of a checkout it's funny it's not the funniest film either kevin hart or tiffany haddish has done it would have been funnier if it was r-rated but for what it is i give it a passing grade Titans, go! When the Teen Titans go to the movies, they know the best way to travel is safely. Hollywood, here we come! The to keep your child safe, be sure to use the right car seat for their age and size. Exactly. We're finally on the big screen. Have a seat, my dude. For more information on finding the right seat, visit NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. Gotcha. That's a wise move. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston Boston Come Through. Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, social events, what? And the black experience. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Smallfoot, which is a 3D computer animated comedy adventure from the Warner Animation Group. And it is okay. It's well animated, I think, and it certainly has a good amount of energy, and I think kids might like it. But as for me, while I will elaborate more on my feelings about it, I didn't think it was anything special, certainly not compared to Incredibles 2 and a few other animated films that have come out this year so far. But Smallfoot is actually based on a book written by Sergio Pablos, which is called Yeti Tracks, and I haven't been able to actually find enough information about Yeti Tracks to tell you about it. I certainly haven't read the book. I assume it might be a children's book, and if it got any wide release, it probably would have gotten a wide release now as tying into this movie i i wouldn't doubt it but the movie is about a yeti in other words an abominable snowman who is convinced that the elusive creatures known as humans really do exist and this yeti who is played by who is voiced by channing tatum and whose name is migo lives in a community of other abominable snowmans on the top of this very steep hill and none of the other yetis that he knows of have actually ventured down the hill what he can see below the hill is basically very thick clouds so he doesn't he and the rest of his yeti community don't exactly know what's down there although they have theories and humans certainly don't know that these creatures are up there on that giant hill it's a kid's story so you just kind of have to go with it so eventually actually there is a theory about the 
their existence and what lies beneath the hills, which I found kind of interesting. And what the theory is, which they tell you at the very beginning of the movie, is that the hill on which they reside, or should I say mountain on which they reside, is actually being held up by four woolly mammoths, which immediately reminded me of the fantasy novel series based on Discworld. And I'm not sure if that connection between the books like The Color of Magic and the, the whole Discworld series was intentional, but it, it did remind me of that. But in any event, I, I did think that the animation in this movie was pretty good. And Channing Tatum as the voice of the head or the main Yeti, Migo, was better than I expected him to be. He certainly had a lot more charisma in his voice that serviced the character well. Very similar to John Cena when he voiced the Bull Ferdinand in the titular film. I, I thought he actually went sort of above and beyond what I expected of uh, an actor like Channing Tatum, who has certainly proven himself to be more than just a pretty boy in other films like 21 and 22 Jump Street and almost every film that's that's come out after that. But I didn't expect him to be an appealing voice of the character, so he did pretty well there. But in any event, Migo eventually travels down beyond the hill when he discovers evidence of human life. And it's it's the yetis who call the humans small foot, not the humans calling a small yeti small foot. So just to put that distinction in there, in, in case you haven't seen the film. And otherwise, there's a very tenacious <laughs> Discovery Channel-like TV host named Percy, who's voiced by James Corden, who's modeled very much after Steve Irwin in the sense that he's... He's hosting a, an infotainment show that is struggling the ratings, but then when he discovers that there that Yetis actually exist, that's when he begins to become even more tenacious and hunt down these white creatures. And there are other various voices with, within this movie, some of whom I thought were well cast, Channing Tatum being one of them. And James Corden wasn't bad as the TV host Percy. It's just, I've seen his character in so many other films before. The, this TV host somehow has to be British or Australian. And I think James Corden, despite being British, was actually going for an Australian accent. But that's kind of a cliche that's been done before. There's also the equally curious love interest, who is another Yeti named Michi, who's voiced by Zendaya, who I didn't think was anything particularly special. There's also the, the leader of this community of yetis whose name is stonekeeper and he's voiced by common which when you look at the character of stonekeeper you don't think common you would have thought an older actor like maybe rip torn and i realize rip torn is dead but somebody an actor like rip torn who probably has more age and more gravitas within his voice i think would have been better and there are other characters like for instance Migo's father, Dorgal, who's played by, who's voiced by, I should say, Danny DeVito, which is, even though Danny DeVito has done plenty of other cartoon character voices, Danny DeVito was well cast. And I, I think that a lot of the other characters were mainly forgettable. There was one character who's another Yeti who's voiced by LeBron James, who I think uh, did a serviceable job. I mean, LeBron James has some acting experience, not much. And this is his first time voicing a cartoon character. I thought he did adequately. But again, I thought the story was very predictable. The, the animation was not quite as good as the Disney Pixar films, but then again, Warner Animation, despite being revolutionary in the animation department from decades past, isn't quite catching up in terms of the CGI animated world. And as a matter of fact, I saw more free-flowing and spont spontaneous energy from the 
Hotel Transylvania movies than I've seen in any films that Warner Animation has done so far. So Smallfoot is not a bad movie. I do think kids will enjoy it. For me, it was a little forgettable, but it gets a passing grade of a checkout for me because I do think that some of the animated voices worked really well. I was pleasantly surprised by Channing Tatum in the lead role, so very good for him. And of course, Danny DeVito, you can't go wrong with him, but Smallfoot just needed a lot more footing. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. I'm probably okay. I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay. I just pop some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzzed driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Listen to She Likes It Heavy on Tuesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern on bostonfreeradio.com. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Hellfest, which is a fun horror movie. It's it's classified as horror, but there are actually some comedic parts to this film it, uh, but that said it is very very dark comedy but it is a really good movie for halloween i think it's a movie about a mass serial killer who turns a horror themed amusement park very similar to spooky world or haunted hayride it's it's not just a haunted house it's also a whole experience where you know kids and adults can can go and actually have a have a tour of various haunted <laughs> or so-called haunted areas and it's a horror themed amusement park that this mass serial killer turns into his own personal playground in the bad sense terrorizing a group of friends while the rest of the patrons believe that it is all part of the show so that is a really good setup for a horror film that i'm surprised hasn't been done years ago but these spooky world and haunted hayride uh, attractions i've been to a couple over the last couple of years they are really fun it, it, it definitely ties into the halloween theme of not only being scared but having fun being scared but it is quite scary to think that some deranged serial killer could just put on a halloween mask and kill whoever he wants within these attractions and the people who are walking around just experiencing this will just think that the dead body in front of them is a prop and that it's just all part of the act that in its in and of itself is scary but hellfest to its credit actually makes it not only a fresh subject of horror film, but it also makes the concept fun rather than scaring anybody who watches this film into not going to a place like Spooky World. Again, I, I think in reality, people might be a little bit more cognizant of a, a, a killer that would murder its his victims and then just leave them hanging around i think eventually somebody would notice within about half an hour not a couple of days but the point is that this movie actually makes this unnerving concept kind of fun and i also think that all the actors in this film none of whom i've heard of before seeing this film really have fun with this concept and i enjoyed this film immensely it's not really enough to tell you what the characters are like you can tell they're they're somewhat jaded college students and they're played by bex taylor klaus who plays the main woman taylor who i think is what not exactly a, a damsel in distress very much like jamie lee curtis in halloween she's unsuspecting yes but not entirely weak and she also goes to this haunted 
display, which is called Hellfest, with her friend Brooke, who's played by Rain Edwards, and Natalie, played by Amy Forsyth, as well as a couple of guys who are interested in them, including Quinn, played by Christian James, and Asher, played by Matt Mercurio. And it's Amy Forsyth who's, who plays the most jaded of the bunch. And I'm not going to tell you who gets killed, but I did like the fact that the movie seemed to approach some horror film cliches, but also almost effortlessly sidestepped them. And I could feel them approaching the vicinity of these cliches, but I knew once they set foot in that, in that territory, figuratively speaking, it, could have potentially ruined the whole film and there are scenes which are of course scary in the fun type of way but there are also other scenes where the serial killer is actually killing someone right in front of the main characters and as you're watching this you're thinking to yourself no don't let him do it don't let him do it (laughs) and then well (laughs) you you kind of get how the the film is going to go but this movie certainly had my attention despite the fact that there's a serial killer in the film it made hellfest actually an attraction i wanted to visit although i'd probably keep my guard up if if somebody with the mask in this movie ever approached me although i'm thinking well who would want to murder me or (laughs) but I, I guess it's one of those things you never really know. One of the things that's actually not explained in this film at all is not just who the killer is, but also why he, and I assume it's a he because the identity is never revealed, and that's not a spoiler, wants to terrorize this particular group of people. And that is never entirely revealed, Actually, it's not revealed at all. And the plus side of not revealing that serial killer in terms of who he is, what his motivation is, why he targeted this group of college students, actually makes Hellfest the most appropriate horror film for a sequel. In other words, this is a film that deserves a sequel. I've seen plenty of great horror films, including but not limited to Jaws, The Exorcist, Paranormal Activity, which I think the sequel actually ruined the original franchise. But Hollywood being Hollywood, if one thing works in a horror film, then they want to just keep remaking the film over and over again with various sequels. But and when I went back to see when when I went to see Paranormal Paranormal Activity for the first time, I left the film with my heart beating out of my chest, almost literally. I mean, it was that scary. But as I was leaving, I was thinking to myself, "Wow, that was a great movie." But I do not want to see a sequel to it. But sure enough, one year later, they came out with one. But Hellfest is different. There are certainly some questions here that are unanswered that I would like to see answered. And Hellfest gets my rating of a knockout. Not only because it is a fun, scary movie and certainly has its share of chills, but it's also one of the most perfect films to come out on Halloween. And I hope that it eventually stays in the top ten or stays in theaters long enough for people to see it on Halloween night because I'm one of those people who once I grew out of trick-or-treating I just went to the movies to see a horror film and if this film is still out on October 31st I might see it again and if you're out in theaters and you see this film around Halloween time I highly recommend it I'm a 40 year old man that walked in there to get his high school diploma it was very hard for me but Miss Araceli she gave me direction at age 47 Marco finished his high school diploma 50% of getting your high school diploma is walking through those doors. The other 50% is doing the work. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. 
Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Lizzie, which is a biography crime drama about Lizzie Borden, who, as you might remember from the the playground rhyme, the demented playground rhyme, murdered both her parents with an axe, allegedly. I'm going to say allegedly because Lizzie Borden was the number one suspect in her, the murder of her parents, but it was never proven without giving too much away that she actually murdered her parents. This is the first time that I can remember that Lizzie Borden's story has been brought to the big screen. There have been a couple of TV movies based on the Lizzie Borden case. There was an excellent one from 1975 that I that I saw years ago, probably even decades ago. And there was another one that Lifetime actually put on their channel, which starred Christina Ricci. And I didn't hear very much about that, but given that it's Lifetime, it probably wasn't the greatest. And this movie, Lizzie, certainly has some valuable assets working within its story, one of them being that Chloe Sevigny is playing Lizzie Borden. But unfortunately... Lizzie Borden was brought to trial in 1892 when she was 32 years old. Chloe Sevigny is 42 years old. And while she looks good for her age, she doesn't look like she's in her early 30s. And I do think for that reason, Chloe Sevigny, even though she's a fine actress and I've admired her for years, she was miscast in this role. But Lizzie Borden is depicted in this one, uh, th- this movie as an unmarried woman of 32, which she was, and she's depicted as a social outcast who's prone to seizures, who is trapped under her austere, domineering father's control, and actually her the woman to whom her father is married is actually not Lizzie Borden's biological mother it's actually her stepmother so in reality the people who got murdered in the lizzie borden case were were lizzie borden's father and lizzie borden's stepmother not her mother but in any event there is a maid by the name of bridget sullivan who is an irish girl who's played by Kristen stewart who does a pretty decent irish accent And when she comes to live with her family, Lizzie finds in her a kindred spirit and a chance intimacy intimacy that blossoms into a wicked plan and a dark, unsettling end. And this movie, very much like probably every other movie made about Lizzie Borden, goes with the allegation that Lizzie Borden actually did kill her parents. I'm not saying that she did, but this movie, almost as a way to sell movie tickets seems to go along with that theory, in addition to the idea that when Lizzie Borden murdered her parents, again, allegedly, she stripped off all her clothes. And unfortunately, when that scene comes about in this film, and it takes a while for that this film to get there, it does show Chloe Sevigny with full frontal nudity, which I thought was unfortunately more exploitative than it should have been. The director of this film is Craig William McNeil, who before this film had directed a movie called The Boy, which I haven't actually seen. It's not the boy that was the horror film from last year starring Lauren Cohen. This is a movie from 2015, and... 
it, it did get pretty good reviews. I can't say anything about it because I didn't actually see it, but it is unfortunately lizzie shows a little bit of sophomore slump if the boy from 2015 was actually that good the movie was this movie lizzie was unfortunately a little slow paced and i think that if the movie had maybe cut 15 minutes out of it it would have been a little bit better paced. And there certainly are some chilling scenes that lead up to the infamous axe murders, but they're a while coming. And I wasn't sure as I was watching this, if some of these things were based on fact or not, it would have been great if they had made the trial that's tacked onto the end of this movie, almost like a narrative framework within this film i think that would have probably made the given the film a better pace without seeming to be too exploitative but unfortunately i wasn't as i was watching this sure if some of the things in this film actually happened or if they were made for dramatic emphasis the the script of the film was written by Bryce Cass, but is not based on any particular novel or source material, which I would imagine a disclaimer in the very beginning of this movie would have given this film at least, given the audience some sort of idea that this was based on a true story, yes, but more inspired by actual events. I would have liked that explanation in the very beginning. Because there were some instances in this film I wasn't sure actually happened. Like, for instance, Lizzie Borden keeping pigeons as pets. And also, there's one scene where she gets into an altercation with her father, and her father handles that by, unfortunately, taking it out on Lizzie Borden's pet pigeons. I also wasn't sure if the romance between Lizzie Borden and Kristen Stewart's character Bridget Sullivan actually happened or if that was made up for this movie and also primarily what I was wondering throughout this film is why is a 32 year old woman still living at home with her parents now the Borden family who lived in Fall River Massachusetts were very well off but why wasn't Lizzie Borden married by the time she was 32 again it's not unusual nowadays to see people in their 30s like myself uh, unmarried but in the 1890s that was very unusual so I, I just didn't exactly know. So Lizzie could have been a great movie, but with miscasting, sluggish pacing, and things that were left unexplained, it it ventures greatly from being great, and it gets my rating of a strikeout. Again, the true story behind it is fascinating. This movie left a lot more to be desired. The Western Scrub Jay. I was taking my science class on a virtual reality bird watching expedition. All of a sudden, Charlie Kane shouts, He had spotted the elusive black swift, a bird rarely seen in the wild. For a brief moment, Charlie had not the eyes of a nine year old boy, he had the eyes of an eagle. Teachers just have better work stories. Find out how creative teaching can be at teachdfw.org. Brought to you by Teach and the Ad Council. I love those real sick sons. They're the ones that move me. A thinly blow. Intensify and groove me. All this and more on Unpacked Music. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next film I'm going to be reviewing for you is Blaze, which is a biographical drama film directed by Ethan Hawke. And I'm not exactly sure if Ethan Hawke has ever directed anything, but he actually co-wrote the screenplay of this film with Sybil Rosen. And Sybil Rosen is the woman who was previously married to country musician Blaze Full 
Foley about whom this movie's life is based. And it's also based on a novel called Living in the Woods in a Tree, Remembering Blaze, written by Sybil Rosen. And Sybil Rosen in this film is played by Alia Shawcat, best known to Arrested Development fans as playing Maybe Funke. And the role of Blaze Foley, the main uh, character in this film is played by a guy who has never acted before in his life. His name is Ben Dickey. And even though the guy has never acted before, he has extensive experience in the music industry and he probably has one of the best debut performances of any actor that I have ever seen. And just to get back to Ethan Hawke about uh, if he's directed anything, it turns out he actually directed the the music video for Stay by Lisa Loeb and Nine Stories, which was the monster hit that came out in 1994 and was included on the Reality Bites soundtrack. In terms of other films he's directed, he's directed one called Chelsea Walls from 2001 and The Hottest State from 2006, neither of which I have actually seen, but I've heard of The Hottest State. And he also directed, Ethan Hawke did, a a documentary which is with the yes which is Seymour an introduction which is a movie about uh, Seymour Bernstein who is a beloved piano pianist teacher and true inspiration so it's probably that experience as a director of a film based on a musician that Ethan Hawke was probably best able to direct this film Blaze which is based on the life of musician Blaze Foley so I was not actually aware that Blaze Foley was a real person I, this movie could have been fictional. It could have been just as fascinating. But Blaze Foley was indeed a real country music artist from uh, um, <laughs> from Arkansas originally, but eventually made a name for himself in Austin, Texas. He was born on December eighteenth, nineteen forty nine, and died on February first, nineteen eighty nine, of a gunshot wound. Not self inflicted, by the way. But Blaze Foley, ever since he died at such a young age of thirty nine, has been a mythical, le- I, a somewhat mythical legend within the country music industry, particularly those that focus more on country roots rather than the more popular country of artists like Alan Jackson and Martina McBride. Blaze Foley was more of a country artist in the same vein as Merle Haggard or probably even more recently the Zac Brown Band. And I found myself not only really liking the story and finding it the most uniquely organized biopic of a musician that i've ever seen but i also really love the music and ben dickey who plays blazed foley in this film is such a dynamic screen presence not only can he play the guitar and sing really well but also he is just he basically is the the real star of this film and it's it, it's, as I said, incredibly impressive for a guy who has never acted before in anything, let alone be the lead role in a in a movie directed by such a star as Ethan Hawke. It's, it's amazing how well he did in this film, and I'd love to see him in more films. And I thought the chemistry between Ben Dickey and Alia Shawcat was one of the best things about this movie, although I will say... There is a scene where eventually Ben Dickey and Ali Shawcat's characters, they're married at one point, but then eventually they decide to go their separate ways. That's probably one of the most heartbreaking breakup scenes I've seen in a movie, certainly since the movie The Theory of Everything when, oh God, I'm getting a little choked up as I'm, I'm thinking about it right now, when... Stephen Hawking, who's played by Eddie Redmayne, and his wife, played by... Felicity, I temporarily forgot the name, but in any event, the two of them eventually decide after so many years of marriage that it's time to divorce. Oh, God, that that was a hard scene to, to watch. And this scene in the movie Blaze, although more brief, is 
still very hard to watch as well. But in addition to that, there are some very good supporting performances, including one by Charlie Sexton, who plays... Blaze Foley's best friend, Towns Van Zant, who also wrote some of Blaze Foley's later songs as Blaze Foley was becoming a more well-known country artist. And there are certain themes of this film that, that come up in other biopics, such as Blaze Foley's alcoholism and his his opportunity to become a big country music star, which he ultimately botches. Those scenes, I wouldn't exactly say they're typical, but it certainly makes the character of Blaze Foley that you see in this film all the more interesting. There are also some great roles in this film by the likes of Steve Zahn, Sam Rockwell, and director Richard Linklater, who I don't think has ever acted in a movie before, although I might be wrong about that, but they actually play what are known as record label cowboys their their names uh, in terms of their characters aren't revealed here but they do pretty well in in the role they're given as as well so blaze is a film i didn't know what to expect going into this film i didn't know it was a true story i found that out later but i was still taken in by this film i loved ben dickey in the in the lead role alia shawcat turns in her best performance and blaze is a knockout probably one of the best musical biopics that i've ever seen up there with amadeus and straight out of compton it really is something else and i kudos to ethan hawk for directing what is probably his best film to date and it's a great musical biopic i highly recommend it Is my kid in the right car seat? I guess she is. There are probably rules on when to move up to a booster seat, aren't there? Rear facing, forward facing, I think I have it right. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Are your children in the right car seat for their age and size? Don't think you know. Know you know. Go to safercar.gov slash the right seat. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've reviewed the five movies that I'm going to review for you for this show, it's now time to get into my final segment, which is What's Coming Up Next? This is a spoken word preview of movies that are coming out in the theater near you, unless I say otherwise, this coming weekend. And there is one huge film that's coming out in theaters on October 5th, and that movie is Venom. Venom is based on the Spider-Man villain that was created when an alien took over Peter Parker's body. And that that storyline was in a comic book that came out in the early 90s, but has been adapted into a film once. Not a great film, Spider-Man 3, but a decent film, I think. But in any event, this movie, Venom, is completely apart from the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies, and this time Tom Hardy is playing the titular villain. When Eddie Brock acquires the power of a symbiote, he will have to release his alter ego Venom to save his own life. The movie also co-stars Michelle Williams, Marcella Braggio, and Woody Harrelson. It's directed by Ruben Fleischer. And even though Venom is a Marvel Comics character along with Spider-Man, I do not believe that the Venom in this movie is a Marvel Cinematic Universe character or in other words the venom with tom hardy is not tied into the mcu which is really unfortunate because if any actor deserves to be in the mcu tom hardy is certainly one of them but i don't think the movies are tied together i could be wrong but rest assured venom is a movie i will be seeing and i will review it for you next week Another movie that's coming out in theaters this coming weekend is the long-awaited remake of A Star is Born. And A Star is Born is 
a film that's been remade so many times. This is probably the fifth time it's been remade. And truth be told, I feel kind of ashamed of this being the cinephile that I am. I have not seen any other adaptation of A Star is Born. I've seen parts of the Judy Garland movie, but I haven't seen the whole thing. That might be an assignment for me this coming week. But anyway, A Star is Born is about a musician who helps a younger singer and actress find fame, even as age and alcoholism send his own career into a downward spiral. So this musician is played by Bradley Cooper. His... Apprentice in this movie, the young singer and actress, is played by Lady Gaga in her first leading role. And the movie also co-stars Sam Elliott and Greg Gunberg, excuse me, Grunberg, and is directed by none other than Bradley Cooper in what I believe to be his directorial debut. So I am interested definitely to see A Star is Born. I'd like to probably see the Judy Garland movie before I get into this. And if I get the opportunity, I will. But even if I don't, A Star is Born is a movie I will definitely see this coming, or rather, yeah, this coming weekend. And I will let you know what I think come next weekend. And the final film that's coming out in theaters this coming weekend, or at least in wide release, is one called The Hate You Give. And this is based on a novel that is a bestseller and was written by Angie Thomas, who made her literary debut with this novel, The Hate You Give. And it is about a girl by the name of Star, who's played by Amanda Stenberg, who is a very pretty young actress, who is starred in some okay movies, but this might be her breakout movie, if it's good, which I can't guarantee. But anyway, Star witnesses the fatal shooting of her childhood best friend Khalil at the hands of a police officer. Now, facing pressure from all sides of the community, Star must find her voice and stand up for what's right. Now, I know that the the book was a runaway bestseller, and the movie The Hate You Give not only got released a very short time after the book saw its release but it's coming out right in time for oscar season so this is a promising contender but i'm not going to say it's a guaranteed contender but either way it's good to see amanda stenberg actually delve into some very challenging material i've seen her in a couple of films that were based on young adult novels and the hate you give is not exactly a young adult novel despite having written by a young adult but the movie also co-stars regina hall russell hornsby and anthony mackie so some other great actors but i will definitely see this movie i'll try to read the book first and i will let you know what i think come next week's show but look at the time that's all for this week's episode of words on film words on film is of course the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures and the views and opinions expressed on words on film about movies or otherwise are solely those of yours truly your host and movie critic dan burke they do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any stations that are airing this broadcast or any employees who are working for the stations airing this broadcast just wanted to get that disclaimer out of there but i've had a really great time discussing films with you i've a great time discussing films with you every week and i'll definitely come here next week and among the films i will review are venom a star is born and the hate you give this is dan burke saying i'll see you at the movies